Welcome to Stuff They Didn't Teach Me in Sunday School. I'm going to date myself by my example, but some of you that uh, can remember before the days of email and uh, Twitter and Facebook might be able to uh, recall this example. I think girls did it more than boys did it after college. Women did it more than men did it throughout their lives. But after college, it often happened that people would write a letter send it to one of their friends with the understanding that that letter would then be sent on to the next friend and that would be sent to the next friend and would be sent to the next friend. It's how we kind of stayed in touch after college. Without having to write five letters to five different really good friends from college, we wrote one letter and asked it to be passed along to other folks. Kind of a circular letter. Some argue that the book of Ephesians, which we're going to talk about today, is just such a circular letter. And I think there's some logic to that. Uh, Paul was very familiar with the church of Ephesus. He founded it. He'd visited there several times, uh, stopped by and on his way back to Jerusalem after his third missionary journey, visited again. He was very familiar with this church, and yet the letter to the Ephesians sounds like he's writing to people that he's not all that familiar with. For example, in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus. A few manuscripts add in Ephesus, but most don't. The oldest ones do not. And so the original address of the letter did not probably say to the saints in Ephesus. There are a couple other lines in here that are just kind of, uh, kind of jump out at you. Um, if you go to 1 verse 15, he says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and then he goes on, that's an odd thing to say when you knew of their faith, you'd, ex- you'd experienced it, you'd been with them, you planted, God used you to plant the faith in their hearts, but he says, because I've heard of your faith. Another line is in 3 verse 2. Paul writes in verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you would have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, assuming you've heard, Paul preached it. Um, And there's several other places like that that indicate that maybe Paul was not familiar with these people. The other thing that's kind of interesting in Ephesians is that at the end of the book, there are none of the personal greetings that you would expect to find in Paul's letters, and indeed you do find in his other letters. Greet so-and-so, so-and-so greets you. None of that. So many scholars think that Ephesians was not originally written to Ephesus necessarily, but written to a group of churches to be passed around from church to church and probably ended up in Ephesus and got the name Ephesians attached to it. That does not diminish the message. It does not diminish the, Paul, the Pauline authorship, and it does not dis- diminish um, the inspiration by the Holy Spirit. But it may well not have been written to the city at Ephesus. The book breaks down very neatly into two parts, and we're going to do it in two parts. The first part is chapters 1, 2, and 3, and chapters 1, 2, and 3 focus on what, God, what God's done for us. It starts out with a, a, a praise section, a Trinitarian praise section, verses 3 and following, and at the end of each section, the first section is on the Father, God the Father, and verse 6 says, to the praise of His glorious grace. The next section is on God the Son, Jesus Christ. And it ends with verse 12, for the praise of his glory. And the third section is on the Holy Spirit, as you might guess. And in verse 14, it ends to the praise of his glory. Almost sounds like like liturgy more than a letter. There is a line in there I'd like to highlight for you in verse uh, 9. For he has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will. The mystery. What's the mystery of his will? According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. And here it is to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth, to bring it all together again. I like to tell classes that I've taught that the Bible is the story of God putting it together in the Garden of Eden, man tearing it apart, and God's process of putting it back together again. So the mystery is that God is going to unite all things to himself in Christ Jesus, and that includes you and me and all of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. If you go to Ephesians chapter 4, 1, beginning at verse 15. Verse 15 through 23 is all one 
sentence. There are no periods in there, there's just a lot of commas. I kind of laugh because I think the, um, the reformers, Martin Luther and Melanchthon and so forth, as they wrote their documents, had a hard time putting a period at the end of a sentence too. And so did the Apostle Paul. There, there are big long run on sentences. This is one classic example of that. But toward the end of that, he focuses on the church. And if you look at verse 22, chapter one, verse 22, he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church. You need to get a grip, a grasp on what the, the idea of the church is. The word there is ecclesia, from which we get ecclesiastical or in, in the Old Testament, even the book of Ecclesiastes. The ecclesia originally had nothing to do with religion, really. It had to do with community life. And the ecclesia was that place where the community people came to discuss things, to to determine the future of the community, to figure out what they're going to do this this building and this park and, and all this kind of thing in the, in the community. And then they were sent out to carry it out. What a beautiful word to use now to begin to describe God's gathered people. People gathered together, not with the gathering together as an end in itself, but gathered together to be sent out to be the people of God, the ecclesia. Beautiful kind of phrasing. There's another line here uh, that comes up. As Paul is talking about uh, the mystery in chapter 3 again, the mystery that God's uniting all things to himself, you and I kind of miss the impact of this. But one of the impacts that Paul highlights in uh, chapter 3, about verse 6, is that this uniting includes both Jews and Gentiles. So that this new church that God is building is a church made up of Jews and Gentiles. And then a beautiful phrase. I love this one. We just read over it so often and, and don't really see what it means. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. I picture it this way. When the angels come up and kind of tug on God's sleeve, assuming God has sleeves, and say, what are you doing down there? Looks like chaos to us. And God says, look at my church. See the unity? See how they get along with one another? See how they're drawn around the person and the work and the sacrifice of, of my son Jesus? See them? That's what I'm doing in the whole world. That's the goal with the whole thing. Love that image. Even the angels are pointed to the church to see what God's doing in his world. And what's he doing? He's uniting us to him in Jesus Christ.